I want to talk for a moment about Joseph's time in Egypt and recognize what God had given to this young man and how he was given great authority in the country of Egypt, Egypt that was one of the most powerful nations on earth. God raised him to a position of authority, made him second in command to Pharaoh. In fact, Pharaoh said, I give you authority over everyone. Everyone in my kingdom is to obey your word. We're going to look at that because many archaeologists and historians are claiming today that there is no evidence that the Jews were ever in Egypt, and especially that Joseph was never in Egypt in any kind of authority. And so they debunk the Bible and say it is not true, it is a fable that the Israelites invented to make themselves feel important among the nations. I'm here today to tell you that we have researched this, many others have researched it and found that evidence for Joseph in Egypt is overwhelming. It's overwhelming the number of facts and figures and stones and papyrus and documents that have been uncovered that show that Joseph indeed was in the land of Egypt. I want to share that with you and some of those, those miraculous evidences that God has revealed to us. I can only do that in this short period of time, but we're putting links to a video there that, uh, about evidence of Joseph in Egypt and then later on a video about Moses in Egypt and the evidence that we have. I think you'll enjoy those. But look at, let's look at some of the evidence of Joseph in Egypt. The Egyptologists tell us that there is no evidence for Joseph in Egypt. But years ago, there was a rock that was found, a huge rock, a boulder, that was found in Egypt. And I can show you a picture of that here if you can see that. Uh, this is a picture of what is called the Joseph Stone. It was written and carved into this rock a thousand years after the emperor or the pharaoh de Djoser, D-J-O-S-E-R. Everyone knew about this character and they knew uh, his story. But this rock revealed something new. This rock was down at the, uh, at the lower falls on the Nile River. It was found, it was a humongous rock. Now it has a crack through it. And Egyptologists were able to translate the rock. And amazingly, it is the story of Joseph. Of course, the Egyptians give him a different name, even as the scripture says that Joseph was given a different name by Pharaoh. In fact, Pharaoh gave his servants many different names. Each one of those important people in Egypt had a multitude of names. I think I count about nine names that were given to this character. But the Joseph Stone declares almost identically, word for word, the story of Joseph that's told in the Bible. Of course, it was written a thousand years after the events, and the people who wrote this were writing it as a as a, uh, a document to prove their inheritance to certain lands, and they have doctored it up a little bit talk, talking about their gods. But the essential story is the story of Joseph. Now Egyptologists that look at this have said, well that can't be, that can't possibly be. It doesn't fit with the timeline that we have for all of the things that took place in Egypt. And so they reject it out of hand. Once they're confronted with some of these other evidences that this was indeed Joseph that lived in the land and was servant of the Djoser, then they back up and say, well, that could not possibly be. It has to be that the Israelites heard the story and they invented it as their story and they changed the name to Joseph to try to prove that they were really in Egypt. How silly to take the evidence that's in the stones and in the rocks and change that and say it's not what it says it is, it's something else. I want to talk to you about this Joseph Stone. The Joseph Stone is still in Egypt, it's still readable by people today, and you can see it online. You can get some pictures and you can read further evidence. In fact, we have given you many links to different arguments for and against this being Joseph. Pharaoh de Djoser had a dream and he dreamed of a famine that was coming he didn't know what to do about it and a young man was called forward to to interpret the dream and that man said i don't know the answer to this dream but i will ask my god and of course the joseph stone says i will ask my gods and they will reveal it to me and they did and he interpreted the dream that there were going to be seven years of of uh, uh, fast uh, of plenty and seven years of famine does that sound familiar to you? Certainly does. And so 
Pharaoh raised this man who seemed to be an Asian, that is from, from the Palestine area, into a prominent position of authority because of his great wisdom and that the God spoke to him and revealed visions and dreams. This is incredible. It's a parallel to the story of Joseph. It's such an exciting thing that we need to give some serious consideration that maybe our esteemed timelines are off. And this is indeed the Joseph of the Bible and talks about the people of Israel. Now this, this Joseph Stone goes on to tell about Pharaoh de Joser and how he raised his servant. Uh, his name is I'm Hotep. Ha, I'm Hotep. I'm Hotep was raised to a position of authority in Egypt and became second in command to Pharaoh. In fact, he was in charge of Pharaoh's palace. Excuse me. <coughs> In fact, he was in charge of Pharaoh's palace and all of his belongings and all of Egypt, not just a portion of Egypt, he said all of Egypt and every person within Egypt was under the authority of Imhotep. Imhotep was the great wise man that wrote many wise sayings. He led the people through this famine and delivered them by accumulating great granaries and being able to feed the people during the time of famine. Does it sound familiar to you? Of course it does, because it is the story of Joseph. And Joseph's name was changed, but it's still he that was the man, I, I'm Hotep. Now it goes further than this. Uh, some people didn't even believe there was such a person as I'm Hotep. It was, it was a name that appeared once in a while, but they said that's a figment of the Egyptian's imagination. There was no such character. And then they uncovered a tomb a tomb in Saqqara in Egypt and that tomb was of the man who built the steppe pyramids and when they opened it they found out his name was Imhotep and Imhotep was the second in command over Pharaoh. He built the steppe pyramids and then he built these granaries that were not barns like we would build. They were granaries under the ground and in front of his tomb are acres and acres of these underground storage houses for grain. This one alone, they said, could hold 400 semi-truckloads of grain. And the scriptures say that Joseph built these all over Egypt. In fact, he built so many he couldn't keep track of them. They lost track of them and couldn't count all of the grain that was kept. Amazing stories, amazing truth. So they, they opened the tomb and they, they began to explore and they found that the tomb was raided like most tombs in Egypt had been raided and all of the riches were taken out, but nobody ever takes a mummy. And they were mystified by this because when they went into Imhotep's tomb, the tomb was empty. The mummy was gone. And they scratched their head, nobody would take a mummy. Yeah, remember the story of King Tut and the people that invaded his tomb and the curse of the, 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 uh, the mummy was on them and seven people perished because of that. All of that superstition that goes along with it were, were superstitions that went way back into time. No one would ever take a mummy. There's no value to it. Who would take this mummy of Imhotep? Of course, we know the rest of the story because Joseph made his brothers promise well, that when you leave this land, you take my bones with you. We know that as a fact, we know that as a truth, and we know that he was not left in Egypt when they made the exodus. He went along with them, they took his bones. And it was probably them that went in and did some of the damage to this tomb. In fact, we can find out that there was a statue of this character, I'm Hotep. It was a statue that was a meter and a half tall, almost twice as tall as a man, and it depicted a man who was of foreign descent. He looked like a person from Palestine, not like an Egyptian. Uh, one of the indications of that was his hair. His hair was braided. It came down like a bowl and down around. They called it a mushroom cut. That was the cut of the people from Palestine. The Canaanites used that kind of hairstyle, but never an Egyptian. So whoever Imhotep was, he had this Canaanite type hairstyle. He also was a statue that had a robe on and they said the backside of the robe looked like it had been dyed or painted in many different colors. Oh, 
makes you want to scream and say, hello, people. Joseph in his coat of many colors, he didn't have it anymore. It was given back to his father, but I'm sure he told the story over and over and was noted by that, that he was a favored son who had that coat of many colors, and perhaps he was buried with that remembrance of him. And then there was a, a reed that was put over his shoulder that indicated he was a foreigner and given authority within Egypt. Tremendous, tremendous examples of who this person was. This person was from Palestine. This person was from the Canaan land. This person had the, the facial features, not of an Egyptian, but of an Asian. He had the haircut of an Asian. He was uh, a statue in the tomb that had been damaged, but replicated so we know what he looks like. And you can find that online and actually see it yourself. Uh, it is a fantastic story that parallels the work of Joseph in Egypt. Let me tell you a little bit more about the, uh, the tomb. Uh, the mummy was gone. Where did the mummy go? Well, we know the mummy went with the people of Israel. And in Joshua chapter 24, it tells us that he was buried in Shechem. Now, if you do a study of Joseph's tomb in Shechem, it's been there for many centuries. And the people of Israel and the Muslims all know about it. And it was, they were feuded over that. It's the place near Jacob's well. Uh, we have known where it stood, but it's been protected for many years. Just in recent years, the Department of Antiquities have allowed that tomb to be opened to inspect it and to, uh, to catalog everything that was in there. And when they opened the tomb of Joseph, they found an Egyptian mummy, a man that had been embalmed in the same way that the Egyptians do, wrapped up in his clothes like a mummy, and uh, in every way it was an Egyptian mummy. And then they found an Egyptian sword buried with him. Isn't that an amazing story? That God is revealing in the last times that Joseph did indeed rule over Egypt and the people of Israel lived in that land for 430 years until the Exodus. It's an exciting story, but it's only the tip of the iceberg that I'm sharing with you now. There's much more to the story that I want you to know and understand. There is a, uh, there is a papyrus in the Brooklyn Museum that lists some of the slaves that were in Egypt at that time and uh, uh, the time of the Exodus. And one of them is the name of one of the ladies that gave birth to children. Uh, the midwives and all of the names that are listed there were Jewish names not Egyptian names the fascinating things that are in our grasp our proof that Israel was in the land of Egypt Joseph was the second to Pharaoh and yet people still disbelieve let me add uh, a couple more points to this argument for Joseph in Egypt one of the Egyptologists, who happens to be a Jew, did a study of Genesis 37 to 50, and he says, above all the other scriptures that he had looked at, he speaks both Hebrew, writes Hebrew and ancient Hebrew, as well as the Egyptian languages and hieroglyphics. He's an expert in these languages, and he says, as he reads those passages, he sees Egyptian expressions, idiosyncrasies, uh, um, little innuendos that are all through the passage concerning Joseph. He said no other place in all of the Bible and certainly no other place in the five books of the Bible do you find so much Egyptian terminology that's used. Makes me wonder if Joseph didn't leave behind a written record of his experience in Egypt. And certainly if it wasn't written, it was verbally passed down through the generations of 430 years so that when Moses came along, Moses knew the story, but he knew it with the, the Egyptian terminology. Finally, there is a place in Egypt that is a, a, um, a lake, a lake that is uh, not salt water, but sweet water. It was made around the time of the Pharaoh de Djoser. There is a canal that was built from the Nile River to this lake. And the, uh, the interesting thing is that the canal that was built is called Joseph's Canal. Doesn't that amaze you? Of course, Egyptians call it other things that are a multitude of names, but the name that stuck was Joseph's Canal.
I want to challenge you to read the links that we have. They can express it far more than I and have much more authority than I do. But I want you to get excited about the fact that scripture is true and we have the archaeological proofs that are available for us and much more than I've given you here. And I want you to be able to give a reasoned argument for the hope that is within you. I want you to be able to answer every man with wisdom and understanding. We don't know all the secrets. We don't know all the mysteries of the Egyptian culture. But the Lord says this in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29. The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever. May God bless you as you search out these things and make sure it's so.